I am Peter Larson, Director of the History Graduate Program at the University of Central Florida, and you are listening to the Riches Documentary Podcast. Ocala. Tavares. Daytona Beach. Oviedo. Apopka. Orlando. Lake Helen. Winter Park. Eustace. Sanford. Welcome to the Riches Documentary Podcast. Riches, the regional initiative for collecting the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, is an umbrella program housing interdisciplinary public history projects that bring together different departments at the University of Central Florida with profit and nonprofit sectors of the community in order to promote the collection and preservation of the region's history. By facilitating research that records and presents the stories of communities, businesses, and institutions in Central Florida, Riches seeks to provide the region with a deeper sense of its heritage. This series will feature a podcast every two weeks, in the middle and at the end of each month, that will explore various aspects of Central Florida history. In today's episode, the Orange County Regional History Center, behind the scenes with Michael Perkins. Michael Perkins, the exhibits coordinator at the Orange County Regional History Center, talks about how to start working in the public history field, how the History Center addresses controversial subjects, and how exhibits are chosen and created. History Center, located downtown in the former courthouse building, showcases 12,000 years of Central Florida history. The museum was accepted as a Smithsonian affiliate in 2006 and accredited by the American Museum Association. Today we will hear from Michael Perkins, Exhibits Coordinator at the Orange County Regional History Center. Mr. Perkins has been with the History Center for over 16 years and offers insight into the field of public history, exhibit creation, and the History Center exhibits. What kind of background is required for somebody thinking of this career? I'm a bit old school in the fact that I don't have a formal museum studies degree. The day I leave here, I would really anticipate that they'd probably hire somebody with more formal museum training, and I would strongly suggest anybody interested in this field pursue something like that. I guess you could say there are multiple paths to this job. Um, But one of the biggest things is to get into something that's going to give you some design experience as well as the museum experience. How are the exhibits created? We have a variety of steps to to come up with our permanent exhibit ideas, uh, designs, and final product. One thing that we do is we test ideas with the public. We also look at what we have in the building and what stories we feel like we need to either add to, change, or just create something new. So there are actually a variety of different ways to do that. Of course, in the museum field, one of the keys is how you tell the story. And to do that, we need to have the artifacts to do it. So your artifacts also help drive what your exhibits are going to be about. So it really depends on what you have in the back, as it were, that you can bring out to really help tell the story. So we have to take what the public wants and what we think that we should include, and then you have to put that in this big melange of what and include what you have three-dimensionally and even two-dimensionally and come up with the ideas that are going to be the things that you're going to uh, incorporate into your exhibits. The History Center is geared towards visitors of all ages, How do the exhibits here educate all of the visitors? We look at our exhibits uh, in depth. Each exhibit has the basic panel at the beginning that tells what the exhibit is about. And then we have larger panels interspersed within that exhibit area that give the main messages of what we're trying to deliver for that particular topic. So it's really important to layer your information. Start with that broad scope and then narrow. And as you narrow your focus, deliver that information in as many different ways as you can. So somebody who wants to visit us in 20 to 30 minutes, and we have 13 permanent exhibit galleries, can just walk through and read the main message big pieces and then catch a few of those slightly smaller panels and still get a nice sense of some of the stories that we're trying to tell. So we kind of have layered information in that way. 
Hopefully the mix of artifacts and images and the way the exhibit looks is such that it'll draw people in so that they'll begin to look around. The turning pieces, the hands-on pieces, different elements like that, that engages a variety of ages. Um, we have some really nice pieces down at our ticket encounter where they can go on a little scavenger hunt. Just mom or dad can take the children and they can walk through and try to find different pieces, artifacts, images, etc. as they go through. That'll help deliver the message to a wide variety of ages so the children can become more involved. And at the same time, that also gets the parents a little bit more involved. The History Center has a full KKK outfit. How is this controversial piece integrated into the museum? We have a complete uh, Ku Klux Klan outfit. And what we have found is if you're matter of fact with something, we've had remarkably little reaction to the Klan outfit. Um, we put it up with a little trepidation, but we said, you know what, it's a part of history. It helps tell this story. We've put it into the context of what we call our fear area. It really helps tell the story of how influential the Klan was in the South uh, during the late 1800s into the early mid-1900s. It's a really compelling piece. We worked with a community advisory group when we put that exhibit together, and they were actually the ones that really were behind us using that particular piece because they, they thought it was very important that, that people see that, that people uh, and get up close and personal with the KKK, as it were, and, and get a sense of just how frightening that group was at the time. It really does help tell a story. It really does bring it alive. And I don't know that our executive directors ever really had to speak with anybody about it, but it's nice to know that if anybody calls us on it, as it were, that we can say we worked with a community group, and they were the ones that strongly urged us to have it in. As a matter of fact, we used to have it out in the open. Some of the school teachers on our school tours weren't comfortable with it. So we built it a small area and put fear in it so people can walk by it now without seeing it. So it's, it's sort of got a soft block. But most people who are wandering through the exhibit are going to see it. It can be very difficult. Um, and it's easy just to say, you know what, we let's just not do that and let's avoid it. But on the other hand, there are some opportunities out there where it becomes very important to do something like that, and we felt like that was one of them. How are the museum's traveling exhibits chosen? Is there a way to tell if an exhibit will be successful? Prediction of a successful exhibit can be very tricky, but we've got good enough at what we do now where we do our market research ahead of time. Again, we have a little interactive element down in our atrium where we ask people what future exhibits they might be interested in, some of them we just make up and some of them we are actually interested in. So that gives us a nice little lead. Some of the previous exhibits that we've brought in have been the ones that have scored the highest on that. We have focus groups in where we'll ask people um, their thoughts about some potential exhibits that we're thinking about hosting, and then we will do our research online. We've even gone to visit exhibits before. We do travel around and see exhibits. We had somebody go out to Seattle to look at the exhibit that we ended up hosting uh, earlier this year. So we'll go and look at them. Uh, we'll pull them up. Uh, a lot of it, we'll call other institutions that have hosted the exhibits that we're interested in to get their feedback, um, and that's critical. And at least get a sense. It's easy for us to say we're a unique market because of where we are uh, and this tourism capital of the world. But at the end of the day, it's mostly locals who visit us. And if it's an interesting exhibit, then they're going to come see it. And if it's not, they won't. Try to find out what they will be interested in. It's really trial and error at first, but. You can narrow your mistakes down if you really do your market research ahead of time. What goes into installing the traveling exhibits? The nice thing about traveling exhibits, especially, particularly the larger ones, and particularly Smithsonian or one of the larger companies or museums that send them out, is they'll send people with them to assist you in the installation process. And they've been through it, obviously. They know what'll fit, what doesn't. They know the flow. They know, well, this will work best next to this piece, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, we haven't always had that. Um, our first exhibit was uh, about pirates, and it was from the Mel Fisher Museum. And we had a truck show up, and it was just in pieces. And we pretty much just had to put that together from whole cloth, and that was fun. But, uh, we, we pulled it together, but that was a little different. So you never know what you're going to get when you, uh, when you purchase a traveling exhibition. Sometimes they just show up, and they're terrific, and sometimes... You've really got to do some dancing to fill your space. How do you create companion exhibits to go along with the traveling exhibits? Sometimes it's a good fit for us to do a companion piece 
and sometimes it isn't. And I guess the best I can do is use an example. We did our Civil War exhibit a few years ago. Um, and of course, Florida was obviously involved in the Civil War, but a lot of people aren't familiar with that history. So we decided to attack that almost like a small permanent exhibit. We put together a crew on staff to come up with this uh, with an exhibit on the Civil War in Florida as a companion. So we had a researcher that write a full exhibit essay, which becomes a companion piece for the exhibit, and then we created this exhibit from whole cloth because there was a lot of Civil War history out there having to do with Florida that people just didn't know. Um, Florida actually played a pretty significant role in the Civil War for the South, but uh, Florida fed the troops with all the cattle. So there was a lot of history to tell there. We went out, we uh, contacted folks and got some really great artifacts to show to help tell the Florida story. So that's a good example of how we can pull together a smaller exhibit to complement the larger one that we'll bring in. We've done that with the Jim Henson exhibit we got from the Smithsonian. We did a puppetry exhibit to complement that one. He really created a big puppetry community here in Central Florida. So we see opportunities to add something about whatever exhibit we bring in. We have an opportunity to add to it, and we'll do that. Which exhibits have been fan favorites? Uh, the most popular traveling exhibit far and away was the Jim Henson exhibit. It had all of the best elements of a popular traveling exhibition. It had the Smithsonian name, it had the Jim Henson name, and it had Muppets. And with those things going on, every child in Central Florida wanted to come and see it. So we had terrific attendance. And again, that was a good example of us learning more about our customers and what they want to see a little bit softer history, like we did our costume exhibit earlier this year, which also did well for us, uh, called Out of This World. Great costumes from sci-fi movies and television. Didn't do quite as well as the Henson exhibit, but still did very well. We've actually got a more serious exhibit coming up on the Working White House, but again, it's uh, got that Smithsonian name. The permanent exhibits that really score well for us we do well with our citrus exhibit because people, of course, expect to discover citrus history coming here. The citrus exhibit just looks great. It really scores well for us. And the other one that does is the Tourism Before Disney exhibit. It was tin can tourist specific, which dates from the 1920s, and it kind of glommed over the rest of the tourism uh, history before Disney. And we sort of changed the aspect of the exhibit and made a paint with a broader picture. We still talk about the tin can tourists of the 20s, but we've got a wigwam that uh, was built for Wigwam Village. Uh, talk about as much of the tourism uh, aspects as we could short of Disney from like 1900 to 1970, right before Disney opened. And again, each of those exhibits, one of them, the tourism exhibit, has a lot of artifacts has a good amount of imagery and a lot of text. Citrus exhibit, not nearly as many artifacts, but a lot of imagery, and it just looks great. We've got the fake trees in there with the oranges on it. They're still popular exhibits for their own right. I'd like to thank Michael Perkins and the History Center for their time. The History Center is located on 65 East Central Avenue in downtown Orlando. Thank you for listening to the Riches Documentary Podcast. Feel free to contact us with any questions or comments on the program that you just heard. Please join us for the next episode, the founding of Bethune-Cookman University, an interview with Dr. Sheila Fleming Hunter. Tells me. Bombay. Geneva. Hi, to see you. Vero, bitch. Donnellan.